this is one of these uh, internal evaluation issues and a preoccupation of many people talking about evaluation. And I have a somewhat counterintuitive view on this. Um, I don't think independence has near as much uh, an impact on quality as most of the people in, in, in evaluation argue. Um, I think much ado is made of this. And I think a perfect example of this sort of confusion, or what I call the confusion, is represented in the recent piece Richard Moore, a friend and colleague of mine, had in his piece on DFAT, where he updated, made some comments on where DFAT was five years after the change. In that note, I'll quote his recommendations. The head of ODE should be an external candidate on a non-renewable contract to maximize independence. <coughs> you know, if you ask me what the head of OED should be, it should focus much more on quality of the person. You should get the best person available. And you should focus not to worry about whether you're going to have a tenured person or a non-tenured person. If the person's good, they should be kept. If the person's not so good, you should probably move on and find another person. So, you know, Richard and that reflected a very, a, a very important theme of evaluation, which I think is simply wrong. And indeed, um, I, I think the message for, for, for EFAT, any evaluation group, looking for an evaluation group, should be to find the best person available. And more important, I think, a message of not taking people from the organization is a terrible message about the quality of people you want to do evaluation. I mean, you want to grow people, and, and you know, the, the, the OD has been pretty effective at bringing new people in and growing people on evaluation, and you want to assure the staff that you know, if someone really does rise to the level, that they'll have access to the top position. So I simply want to say that, that remains my view, and I think it's important that it's reflected very much in my experience in the bank. The best people I saw, and as I said, I did deal with them over a period, were people that from within the bank who, who rose to the top position. So independence and evaluation is a topic people like to talk about, but I don't think it's a very sensible topic. Um, I want to tell a couple of things about what I've seen happen during my time in OD, because I think it's important. The first one I want to talk about is really what I think has become a best practice, uh, which was a little bit, it's a bit of a hidden gem, because it wasn't, we weren't aware of it, quite frankly, when we began. Um, I'll say DFAT have always had a process of doing operational evaluations within the working staff of DFAT, and so they're not the big strategic evaluations that OD tends to concentrate on. And about four years ago, in the discussions when, when this was discovered, a decision was made to actually do an evaluation of that work. And I have to say, there was some nervousness on the part of the committee about doing this because no one knew exactly what to expect. There had not been any comprehensive review. And indeed, when the review was done, it was quite interesting because what one found was actually you know, an important resource of good evaluation. Certainly, I would argue that consistency is not the same with strategic evaluations and not the same oversight, but there was a lot of good evaluation work being done by operational staff. And I think this is a message that you know, really is important to give, that DFAT both has a capacity to do ODE evaluations, but also allows and supports staff in doing operational evaluations at the working level. So to me, it's a, it's a strong message about the commitment both the resources and time of the management of DFAT, and I think it should be complemented. Uh, there's been a recent review done again, uh, more recently. Those reviews have resulted in suggestions to consolidate the, the work, and I think that's important because I think that will lead to, lead to some improvements because very often OD is asked to help support that work, and it also has limited resources. The other thing that happened was in the first report, the discovery was that not many of these reports were available to the public. And we pushed transparency very hard with the IEC. And as a result of that, you're now seeing a record of actually getting these reports not just completed, but they're also all being made available to the public. And I think that's an important additional asset for the discussion of evaluation in the region. Uh, my fourth point is, is, a, is a point that I, I think I didn't realize as much as we began with, but actually ODE has played a key role in working with um, 
particularly the, the management division, the aid management division, on focusing on and ensuring about the quality of oversight of DFED operations. So this wasn't in the original terms of reference, but it's interesting, we've had a very good, we've had a very good relationship uh, with the management division. And when issues have arisen about quality, there's been a good discussion between IEC and that group. So it's been an open and constructive relationship. And let me just give you two specific examples because I think they reflect the sort of work that is being done to reinforce and assure quality. The first one is, uh, is you know, AQC quality. These are the reviews of individual investments over $3 million. And so there's a regular process of, of ODE reviewing the quality of those reports and ensuring that they meet appropriate standards. Uh, when there are weaknesses seen, there's a discussion with the working level staff, and that work, I think, has provided important signals to management about the quality of staff, of the quality of the actual projects. Um, two years ago, two or three years ago, when some very modest changes were made in the instructions on AQCs, all of a sudden there was a dramatic improvement in project quality by at least the ratings. And so this was something both the aid management division and ODE worked on. And within a year, there was an ability to go back, review what the instructions were, and get, we felt, and, and the aid management division felt more, more accurate, more consistent records on performance. And so you had there one example of where I think the work actually made sure that the focus on quality remained high. Second example is a very new one. Um, there's a new acronym, FAQCs. These are the final AQCs. And historically, the instruction um, in, in originally in Allstate and then DFAT was the staff had a requirement once during the life of a project to do an independent review. And, and this was one instance where I'm afraid my biases from the World Bank um, came to the fore. And fortunately, Wendy, who was also involved in this, but has also worked in the World Bank, um, had the same bias, that this didn't make a lot of sense, that what would be much more useful for management would be a review at the end of, an independent review at the end of the project cycle. So that at the end of the project cycle, the manager would have more consistent messages, both about where investments uh, were successful, where they were not, and where there were problems either at the country level or the sector level. And I'm pleased to say that's now been accepted. And so FAQCs are now a part of the quality review function. And I'm hopeful that they'll contribute again to ensuring that there's accurate views of where portfolios stand, where there are problems, and where, where there are successes as well. Uh, my next point is just to summarize a little bit uh, my view that a lot of excellent work has been done. And I'm talking now not about IEC work, but about the, the work that ODE has done. And, both meeting the standards of delivery that were expected, ensuring that with strategic reviews that they're all made available, as well as other important pieces of publication that they do. And so I want to emphasize that, you know, the, the role that I see in this is actually fairly modest because all the real work is done by ODE, and it's been a pleasure to be associated with that work. Um, just a couple of things which, which I remain very proud of. Um, a lot of work has been done over the last couple of years on disability. And this has been a particularly hard area because there's not a lot of work in the, in, the, in the outside world. And I think Australia has emerged as a leader in this area. And I think the evaluation both has underlined that point. But it's also begin a, began a struggle of trying to figure out how disability work can be better reflected in the eight projects that are done. So this is a work in progress. But I think it's been an important activity. Uh, as some people know, I'm an Africanist. I spent most of my bad career working on Africa. And I, I'm, I think Odie should be very proud of the work that was done on the Horn of Africa uh, humanitarian crisis in 2011. Um, and it's important not just because it was a good piece of evaluation, but I think it sent an important message about the capacity within DFAT in terms of its global role. Um, DFAT's not a big actor in the African community. And it wasn't even a big actor in terms of amounts in dealing with that crisis and that food crisis. But some 
junior DFID staff that were on site made the decision to get involved in the crisis in an active way and to work on aid coordination. And in fact, from the analysis, and I think it's accurate, played a much more effective role in improving coordination than many of the longer time big actors in the food business in East Africa. And so I think you had there was a clear discovery of a capacity that Australia does have to both work effectively with other donors, but also to, to play above its weight in terms of its role on an important humanitarian issue. So I think there was a clear message there. Um, very proud of the first work that went completely through the process um, on, on Australian volunteers. Uh, we did have a discussion. It was the first uh, document that was discussed. Um, there were some criticisms and some sensitivities, but in the end, everybody felt better because it was given an award as an excellent piece of evaluation, the annual review. But I mean, I think there are two messages. Steve still doesn't agree. I think there are two messages. One, this issue of actually having these meetings where there are comments and inputs, I think, is very important. Evaluation doesn't get this much attention more generally, and actually, I'll come back to that. The second point I was going to make on documentation is that OD doesn't only do strategic evaluations. They have a full range of other work that they do, both to monitor the work that's going on. They do regularly updates on evaluation policy to make sure people know what's going on. Um, policy notes come out. And, and there, this review of past recommendations, I think, as I mentioned before, is an important aspect of the follow-up and the learning. And finally, the spot check work, which is done on AQCs, has been, I think, an important part of the overall quality function. Um, I'll, I'll comment a little bit on the ANU issue, because I think that is another best practice. I mean, I'm a little bit surprised at the crowd today. Um, there aren't many places that evaluation gets this level of attention. <laughs> so it's certainly pleasing to me to see that. Um, generally, attention falls very much on the sideline. And I think the ANU uh, defects interaction to put together these on a regular basis has been an important way of both sharing lessons from experience, but also um, encouraging people um, to think a little bit more about evaluation. And as I said, it's been an opportunity to critique and to make suggestions about how reports um, can be improved. So I think all of those are, are important aspects, and I want to both express my appreciation for what ANU has done on that front, but also really express my hope that this can continue to be built on and sustained, because I think it's a, it's a somewhat unique. I haven't been able to find any other examples of where this sort of support has been given to evaluation in other, in other areas. Um, I, I would be dishonest if I didn't least suggest some of the issues that I think still remain. Uh, these are issues that we spend time on, so it's not going to surprise anyone um, on the DFAT side. And, and there are really three. Um, one is, um, if you look at most of the evaluations, um, somewhere it says they're qualitative evaluations. And the, the explanations are many, but uh, you know, I'm, I worked at the World Bank. I was, a, I was supposed to be an economist in the World Bank. And I just think you've got to do more work on the quantitative side to produce you know, credible evaluations. There are some evaluations that a good job on that. Some work was done on roads in Indonesia, which I think was excellent work on evaluation, putting in place rates of return. But this is an issue that we've raised often in the IEC meetings. In yesterday's meeting, we had a discussion of one case where we think it's coming to fruition in terms of an evaluation of teacher training where there is going to be an attempt to produce some real data so that judgments can be made about the impact of teacher training um, on the performance of students. And I just make the general observation that I think this is an issue that has to be continuously, continuously pressed. Related to that is the issue of data. And I have to say, um, here I, I, I contrast all the time in discussing data, macro data and sectoral data. Uh, the colleagues across the street from where I worked in Washington, the IMF, have worked for now for over 75 years on improving the quality of macro data. They do it in every country. They acknowledge their countries with stronger and weaker data, but they retain that responsibility, and so you have systematic and consistent 
macro data with weaknesses, but it's there. When you go over to the non-financial, non-macro side, the data situation globally is a mess, and it's a mess particularly in low-income countries. So when you look at data sets, and as I said, I worked in Africa, you look in Africa, you look in the Pacific, you know, what you see are blank spaces, and what you see are, you know, spaces with footnotes which says, you know, latest data 2013. And, you know, I think data is really important for policy work to make judgments about the impacts of policy, how things have changed. And I think, you know, the data issues and, and getting more data on the table is important. And it's not only an evaluation issue, I think it's a broader issue with respect to analysis and how analysis is done, and I'll, I'll come back to that. My third issue is, if there's an area I'm a bit disappointed, we haven't done as many country studies as I think you know, should be done by, by, uh, by the ODE. Um, country studies really represent and can give signals about a different unit account than a project study, and it's an important unit account because I think once you draw lessons more broadly from project experience, it can both help understanding where problems and issues are, and it can provide an environment for discussions with not just the counterparts at the sector level, but also the important counterparts at ministries of finance in prime minister's office to try to bring about broader reform in countries. So these are three areas we've talked about a lot. I think I can point examples of where there's been progress, but I think these are still a work in progress, which certainly I, I, I expect IEC to continue to focus on in the future. And I'm sure with Wendy there, yeah, that's going to happen. Um, a couple of issues, uh, I, I said I'd talk a couple of issues about broader concerns about, not concerns, but issues that I see about DFAT, about the aid program. And it's, it's a fairly modest list because I don't consider myself an expert on DFAT or Australian aid. But I thought there are a couple of things I wanted to comment on. The first one is the level of aid, and that's been an interesting issue during my tenure, where I think I have sympathy with some of the criticisms about, um, about the declines, but I, I have to make one positive observation before I come back to some of the concerns that have emerged as a result. The positive observation is just looking at it as a budget issue and how the budget issue was handled. I'm quite impressed with the way the cuts were handled. If you look at the first round of cuts, those were largely handled by a, a sort of consolidation, a focus on regional issues, a focus on Asia uh, and, and Pacific uh, as well. And I thought that was a sensible way as a, as a former budget person in the bank. I thought that was a sensible way to deal with that. The second cut was handled in a way that I was actually impressed with. Because as, as it was being discussed, the one question I had is, does Indonesia get hit? Because Indonesia's had a long and important relationship with Australia. It's an important economy in the region. But also, Indonesia has gotten more prosperous and probably is less dependent on aid. So do you go down the road of simply endorsing past history, you know, or do you reflect the recent developments and actually force a cut on Indonesia? And DFAT did force a cut on Indonesia. So I, I saw two cutbacks, which given the decisions, the actual budget allocations, I, I was impressed with. At the same time, I think there's been a cost to this. And it's not the cost that people so often focus on, in, in my view. The cost people focus on are the macro numbers. You know, we're giving some percentage of, of aid and it's reduced to another percentage. Um, that is a cost, certainly. I don't, I don't disagree with that. But you know, I'm of the school that says development comes not just through money, but also through policy change. And so money alone doesn't impress me that much. But at the same time, I think there have been real costs, and I just want to underline from my experience a couple of them. You know, the removal, I, I feel personally, the removal from Africa was a cause. But I have a more subtle point, I think more important to that. In my experience, um, the governments didn't always like it. But I can point a hell of a lot of experiences where African challenges and Pacific challenges look alike. <coughs> and I think cutting off that experience has been done at, at some cost. Uh, for two reasons. One, because you've got more countries and they're bigger in Africa. And so you have a broader range of experiences which come to the table. 
but also because I've just seen things that have happened in Africa that haven't happened yet in the Pacific, and vice versa. But one of the things that I've seen in Africa, everybody in the Pacific is talking about the private sector, the bigger role of the private sector. But one of the things that's happened in Africa that hasn't happened in the Pacific is there's a lot of private investment going into self-standing solar programs in rural areas, which are totally self-standing self-financing. And I've looked, I've done some work in the last six months in the Pacific, and nobody's doing that. And there's still major challenges of delivering electricity in rural areas in the Pacific. And if the choice is between doing that through governments, which already have financial constraints, or being able to bring in a private sector to do it, I think it's something that is actually important advice for the region. So that's one thing that I feel. The other is that you saw a significant reduction in Australian participation in global programs and global interventions. The one I know the most about is Australia expected to become a major donor in the global education front, and that essentially got precluded by the cuts. A final comment is a more general one, that for a while Australia was getting a lot of attention and interest from the outside, and there were a lot of visits, and you know maybe, maybe sometimes for the wrong reason. Maybe people were coming to see if they could tap into some of the additional funds. But the point is, I saw much more activity of people coming in from the outside, including, <laughs> said with a little embarrassment from the World Bank. But the point is, being a place where there's noise and there's interest and there's enthusiasm and there's all the resources is not a bad place to be for working on development. And so I think in, in all three of these areas, I think there have been costs. And again, it's not so much about the aggregate cuts, it's just about the messages and what had to be dealt with as a consequence. My final comment, my final broad comment, is about economics. Um, you know, I come from an institution that's well known to be dominated by economics. But I have to say, I am still consistently taken aback by the limited economic skills in the Australian aid system. Um, and it's important for the programs you're working on. I mean, growth in the Pacific is the issue. If you can get growth, I'm not one that's going to argue every country is going to be sustainable. But I think the right challenge is our governments working to do what they can do to improve their environment, their policies, and their positions. And you know the, that challenge is a real one. And I think we need economists to work both on the growth issue, but more generally on policy issues. Economists have a useful role to play. Uh, I'm saying this in spite of the fact that I think economists in my, in, in my home country where I live are embarrassing themselves constantly with poor analysis and poor policy recommendations. But I hope we can meet higher standards than that in the development field. And I do feel, I mean, I've met with every uh, chief economist since I started working on, on the Pacific in 2008. And everybody agrees we need more economists, but it hasn't, it hasn't happened. Um, I also think the economists are a vital part of getting some of this work done on, uh, on, non, on financial issues and on, uh, on, on quantitative work to support the work on projects. And economists play, a, play an important role in that. So I, I, you know, it's a message that I think everybody gets tired of me talking about. I always say, where are the economists? Um, I think there has been an effort, certainly under the, under the work program of, of ODE, to ensure that when there's a case for economists, um, that they are, they are an integral part of the team. But I just think it's more general that this is a, sh a shortage in the system. I have about six comments on the Pacific challenge to conclude. As I said, this is an area that I've, I've been spending some time. Um, when I went to work in East Asia, I didn't think the bank was taking the Pacific very seriously. And so in that job, I think I can say with a straight face that I certainly encouraged uh, more work there and more attention there. And I'll, I'll come to that because a lot more has happened since I was there than when I was there, so I want to be honest about that. But as I've emphasized, I think the growth issue is key. Getting growth up in the Pacific is key. Um, the slow growths of the past um, are not going to provide for the types and the levels of uh, quality of life that people want to achieve. 
As related to this, I think the private sector challenge is key. And here again, I, I, face, I feel a very strong similarity between what I see in the Pacific and what I saw in Africa. Every government now is sensible enough to say that donors, ah, yes, the private sector is important. Yes, we're focusing on the private sector. And so what I do these days is actually, I, I, I don't always push uh, bank or IFC work, but I always go look at the doing business numbers. And you know, a place like when they began in 2007, 2008, a little over 10 years ago, um, Fiji was actually a pretty good performer. It was in the top 30. Today it's around 100. When you look at all the other countries in the region, just like the countries in Africa, they all fall in 100 plus, or around 100. And what that shows, I think, are two things. One is the absolute performance isn't very good. But I think more important, it, it's a message about relative performance and what's been done. Because you know, the, the doing business stuff is not magic, and it has to be always handled with some judgment and perspective. But what it does show is some countries move up, and other countries move down. So you see relative performance, where I think it's a fairly reliable guide. And, uh, you know, a country in Africa, Rwanda, that was, you know, in the high, mid, mid hundreds, you know, is now in the top 30 because they really worked hard on improving policies for the private sector and it's showing up on the growth side. So again, that linkage. Uh, my third point is to come back to the use of the, the, the MDBs, and particularly the Asian Bank and the World Bank. And I have to compliment the government of Australia here. Um, I think they've done a really good job of waking up the MDPs with respect to the Pacific and getting them involved. Over the last five years, ADB support, and ADB had a more traditional relationship, but ADB has doubled its support. The World Bank has tripled its support from a lower base than ADB. And so you, for the first time, you really have credible engagement in the region by the, the two major MDPs. And so I'm hopeful that they can certainly play a role. They now have big office in Sydney, big regional office in, um, in Suva, um, increasingly putting staff in individual countries to work with the countries on reforms. And I think that's an asset, and I give the Australian government enormous credit for this, because certainly during my time, I saw the emphasis that it's obviously been sustained, and if anything, become more effective subsequently. So I think it's an important aspect. Because one of the things that, that I see is, it's hard, it's hard to see from the region, but I see as a comparative basis, is when I was country director in Tanzania or Uganda, I had 30 donors out there, all of whom had money. And you work in the Pacific, and it's four or five donors. And of course, you face the, sometimes the challenge, sometimes the asset of always being the biggest person in the room. So I think by gauging the MDBs, it helps both because they bring you know, experience from outside, um, but also because they're bringing funds. One of the things the World Bank has just done is made PG eligible for IDA for the first time. And I think that's going to help increase the program um, that the bank can do, do in Fiji. Uh, fourth point, uh, capacity building. Um, you know, certainly the center's doing a lot of this with respect to some of the neighboring countries. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. But I think, I think more generally, um, and I feel the same way about Africa, you know, an enormous push was made in independence in these countries. And that generation is starting to leave. And these are some of the senior good people in these countries. And for a variety of reasons, um, I think there are challenges for the next generation that haven't been very effectively addressed by the international community. So I'm a big believer in trying to think through this issue. You know, there's always frustration with people saying, ah, we've done all of these scholarships. Um, the two observations I always make is one, that you know, you've got to be more selective in identifying people. And two, I, I think the effort is too broad. I, I think you've got to make a decision to focus on some key skills and make sure those skills are properly supported. And this gets people upset when I start discussing which areas, because I always begin with economists, of course. <laughs> but the point is that I, I think as I look at donor programs generally, they've treated low-income countries in a way too often that you were trying to replicate capacity 
that existed in countries of much higher levels of income. And that dispersion has resulted in not so consistent capacity in areas where you really do need capacity and high level capacity to deal effectively in today's world. So I'm, as I said, I think capacity is still an issue. I have to highlight um, the work being done here on labor mobility. I think it's really important in the context of the global climate change and some of the other issues. Um, the bank had done some early work on this largely with New Zealand, and I think that it's been picked up particularly here is very important. Obviously, climate change is a critical issue in the region. Um, I was hopeful that new instruments were going to bring a lot of new resources. I was never one that believed these numbers of 100 billion a year. Those were completely fabricated numbers, basically counting anything anybody did on anything as support for climate change. I've been a little disappointed that the institutions haven't picked up as quickly as one would have hoped, but there clearly is additional resources. And what I find interesting is, you know, on the ADB and World Bank side, their view, which I think is, uh, which I think is the right view, is that if the institutional problems continue, they're prepared to scale up and use more of their resources on this because it's such a critical issue. Just um, for issue for the region. And finally, as I said, um, you know, I, I think this, this African story and the interactions and strengthening those can make you know, some, important, some important contributions on both sides. You know, one of the strange things I found, you know, coming from Africa, you think of Africa as aid dependent. Um, and when I joined the East Asia region and the bank, they produced all these briefing books, none of which I look at. <laughs> But very shortly after I joined, Bob Zellick, the president of the bank, was coming to Australia. He was coming to an APEC meeting. He had been involved in the formation of APEC, so had had this nostalgia. So I accompanied him, and then you know, you're on the plane, it's a long ride, so you read the briefing book. And I remember the exact number, which I thought had to be a mistake, that the average per capita assistance to the Pacific was $315. You know, I was a hero in East Africa if I raised $50 for capital. I mean, I was a hero. And so that was what you know, made this impression on me. Very clearly that you know, it is an aid-dependent region, and there are some linkages that can be exploited. I'll conclude by making a couple points. First of all, I want to thank Wendy and Stephen, who are my counterparts. Um, Stephen, for the past four years, Wendy, from beginning. We've had a good relationship every once in a while. We argue, but we never fought. And we've always managed to give consistent messages, and I think their part of that has been key. And finally, I want to thank OED. A lot of OED. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> this is an inside joke. For my first four years in, uh, in IEC, I, I kept talking about OED instead of ODD. OED. OED is the Operations Evaluations Department in the World Bank. So I couldn't hear it. But I, I'm much better at that. Now I've screwed up. I apologize. <laughs> public statement. But I want to thank you know, the work that's been going on. And we've really had probably two or three generations now of staff in OD. And I think the quality has been sustained and built. I think the work. And they, as I said, they do all the work with respect to the evaluations. We certainly are in a privileged position of being able to comment and observe. But I, I, you know, I think and to Australia, you can be thankful that it has a very good group of people working on um, evaluation within the development side, and that, that group is given appropriate support within DFAT. So I, I've enjoyed my time, and I guess I'm available for questions or comments. Obviously, very difficult and critical question. I'm wondering how 
uh, the World Bank dealt with those issues. No, let's take a couple. Okay, we'll take a couple. Thank you. Um, my question uh, is about your seven year summary of ODE work. Um, what success in um, improving the quality of the M&E frameworks in individual programs? Things like baselines, uh, realism, um, attributions. Thank you, Jim. Um, we really miss you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask you about a couple of things. Um, first of all, if you had a comment about country ownership, country ownership of the monitoring and evaluation systems that belong to individual activities, um, but also country ownership when it comes to evaluation. Um, and what that role should be, and what ODE's role should be relative to um, country ownership. And the other um, thing I'd like to hear your comments on is that Australia, if a Labor government is elected, is talking about an evaluated general office um, that would exist as an independent office in the, in the government system. Um, I wonder what your thoughts were about an evaluated general. Um, first, to start with the question, uh, you know, particularly in the bank, World Bank, I mean, the evaluation score is much bigger. And so you're producing, you know, scores of reports, both at the strategic level, but also enormous amounts at the transaction level. Uh, the bank does, you know, to, to, to make it related to the FAQ policy change that I talked about, you know, the bank has every task manager complete an evaluation at the end of a project and then has a formal review by the independent evaluation group. Um, so there's, there's much more going on. And the bank has the capacity to both do things at the macro level and do more targeted evaluations in a way that I think is harder with, uh, with, 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 with the operation size of DFAT. So it doesn't have to make too many hard choices in that respect. Uh, the big choices, I mean, I think the one issue that we have, a, we have a new Director General and she's struggling with what the priority should be. Um, I think the big question in the bank is evaluation moved from a big focus on investments and quality of the program to a lot more focus on less, um, less focused discussions on, on bank procedures. And I, I think it's gonna be interesting to see how she reacts but my suspicion is she's going to go back to be a bit more traditional, because you had you had IG commenting on sort of everything the bank management did, and the bank management, in my view, wasn't particularly impressed with that. So it has the capacity, and it certainly does do both broader studies, but also is able to drill down and has a lot more flexibility than the effects of doing that. M&E. Well, I'm going to join M&E, and and the discussion on country ownership, and because I have a somewhat eclectic view on this. It's not the view of most agencies, including the World Bank. Uh, an enormous amount is spent on m and &E in individual projects by all donors. And yet, the performance is not stellar, including in Australia, including in the World Bank. And I think I've discovered the reason for that and worked hard in the bank to convince people that I should be listened to, it wasn't very successful. The point I made was, in the end, the ownership is the key thing. And if you look at a minister or PS, why would they be interested in any for an individual bank project or an individual Australian project? The issue is to get a broader management system and a more data system that actually works. And so the data thing that I talked about is part of it. And, um, it's getting more attention in the bank now because the bank sees these weaknesses. And I think the whole issue of big data has put pressure on, shouldn't development be thinking more about this than it has historically? So I've been a big believer in, if, you, if you're interested in the ownership question, you should be developing government systems to monitor what's going on generally. And as part of that, yes, have some ability to do some granular work. Uh, but that's not where the money goes right now. The money goes, everybody tries to build 
project specific monitoring evaluation systems. I mean, you know, say the staff must spend, uh, DFAT staff must spend hours and hours harassing their contractors. We need better data on the project. But I think it's going to get the overall system going better. It's a weakness. So I, I have a view on that. It's, it's not an accepted view. Um, we certainly spend time in IEC talking about improving data. It's an issue with management, and it's certainly a concern of the management that it gets. But on that, I'm afraid OSIT, uh, in fact, faces exactly the same problems that all the other donors do. And it's, it's a very mixed record as a result. And as I said, I have a logical explanation for it, but the, the traction of that explanation has not been very, very heavy and very effective. Uh, okay, Evaluator General. It's interesting, during my seven years, certainly more than five times, we've been called by other parts of the government to say, what are you doing? Why is it useful? We, um, we go to those meetings, we have interesting discussions. The conclusion I reach from that is that in order, Evaluation General, whatever you want to call it, is probably makes sense. Because right now, if you ask me honestly, you know, the aid program is under a much more serious microscope than the rest of the government program that, uh, that has emerged in these discussions I've had. Now, in partly it's a function of aid generally has, has emphasized the role of evaluation more than most government programs, and it has strengths and it has weaknesses. But I, you know, I think it would probably be constructive let some other groups be subjected to the sort of discipline and other expenditure items that you have in the, in the aid program. I also have to say that in DFAT, it's very interesting. We've got enormous support from the leadership of DFAT. And the concern that emerges in that is a concern to make sure that all the evaluation doesn't simply focus on aid, that there are other parts of DFAT that could also use some attention and focus in terms of evaluation. <coughs> so I, I, I'm impressed, at least within the ministry, uh, at least with the secretary, there's a clear sense that she's giving this priority and wants to wants to see better work in this area. Now, I'm sure, um, knowing diplomats as I do, they'll have long explanations of why you can't do evaluation and diplomacy. <laughs> but my instincts are clever people could probably produce some interesting observations about what works and what doesn't. Great. Um, we do have time for another set of questions. Sorry. Yes, hi. Thank you. Um, Earlier on, you mentioned the operational staff doing evaluations in DFAT, and I think you referred to it as a, a hidden gem in the department. Um, what do you think are the relative strengths of operational areas doing monitoring and evaluation work and specific evaluation areas doing that work? And if you were to build the ideal system, how would those two things be, be mixed? Uh, Jim, well, I just want to thank you on behalf of the ANU for your, uh, your engagement over the years and your contribution. Uh, I can still remember when you were announced, which I think was on budget night, yes. uh, in fact, in 2012. And of course, we hope you'll still continue to visit and uh, contribute after your time. But uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, you're probably the only person associated with the A program who's doing the same job now. <laughs> they were in 2012, yes. <laughs> and, um, I just wonder if you could reflect on differences. You know, there have been some big shifts, both in the government and, of course, from OSA to DFAT. So any, any reflections on that as well? Your engagement, I'm sure, would interest us. Thank you. Um, this is Thank you. Yes, uh, Kim Brand here from Indigenous Affairs. We, um, we've been very um, lucky to be able to follow in the wake of your experience because um, <coughs> you are a leader in the... Uh, the approach that ODE takes, I think, in um, the Canberra Federal Public Service. So it's been really inspiring to see how you've done what you've done with the committee. Um, I wanted to just pick up on the issue of independence that you mentioned, and you focused, I think, on the independence of the head of ODE. And I wondered if there were other aspects of independence versus quality that you would like to elaborate on, on reflection, because I think there's a lot more to it in terms of the independence which is used as a flag, I guess, for something that's high yes. quality and expertise in an independent external evaluator. 
Um, but I don't think the world is quite that simple, and I think every, everyone is subject to various forces which make us do whatever we do. So I think there are lots of risks on both sides. So I'd like to hear your reflections on that. I'll talk about the positive side of independence when you get away with, away from some of these narrow ideas because I agree with that. But let me start our self-evaluation. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer in self-evaluation because it's one way to ensure more direct learning if people actually do the work. So in that sense, I think the operational work is very good. Within DFAT, it's, it's often in interaction with, with ODE staff, and so you do have an interaction. They reach out to ODE and ask for help. And so I think it's quite a constructive and quite a healthy piece of the evaluation puzzle, which as I said, was not really elaborated on or explained when we started doing this. Um, you always have to make choices, and you still have to deliver your broader strategic program, and so there are constraints. Um, my, my instinct, but if I was asked where I would put more money now, is I think DFAT has to be better at ensuring that the lessons that are learned are more broadly disseminated across staff. And it's a tough issue because it means taking staff, and I'll actually come back to this on Steve's question because I do have some views on what's happened as a result of the change. Um, so I, I, you know, I just think you, you gotta encourage self-evaluation, but you gotta recognize it, it can't be all self-evaluation because you do want someone looking over people's shoulders and you need a mix. And I think BFET in the present si situation has a very nice mix. Now Steve's asked the hard question, which is what I would have expected. Um, I'll say one thing, where I agree with Richard Moore's analysis. The government has a focus on <coughs> reducing the number of staff in the bureaucracy, and this is pretty common now in countries these days. Um, and I think there's an issue there with respect to the aid side, because in the end, you had an organization focusing exclusively on aid and the delivery of aid. It's been absorbed in another organization, and you both reduce size and you put the staff in a situation where if you're a you know, reasonably ambitious young person, do you want to do the aid route, which is now a smaller piece of the puzzle, or do you want to do a more traditional development route? And so I worry what's happening. Richard talked about this, is that there's a movement of resources in an overall more constrained situation, which means less resources are going to the aid program. So I worry about that because First of all, it's a different business. And interestingly, it involves a lot more resources. I mean, when, I, when, the, when the reorganization first happened, I figured I'd better take a look at what this DFAT is about. And you know, DFAT's main resource issues are about maintaining the quality of embassies and the security of staff. That's a very different business from trying to do development across Pacific and particularly of trying to do it in the Pacific. So I think that's a challenge. And I think that's the big one. You know, and I, I hear the rumors of what different people are saying and doing about aid, so I'll leave that to you in terms of those discussions. But I hope there's an ability to you know do serious analysis of that issue so that there's a confidence that the staff are being put in place to properly oversee the program. You know, I've had to learn a lot because it's a very different system than the World Bank. And the World Bank, we make the governments do the projects. Now, the consequence of that is that I think you're better on the policy side, a little bit better on capacity building, but everything takes a lot longer. You know, it's sort of a quiet secret that ADB and the bank take longer to do things mm -hmm. than most bilaterals because bilaterals traditionally use the Americans and the Australians have a model that heavily focuses I'm bringing contractors to do it. So I can do a long speech on the relative strengths and weaknesses, I won't. But in that piece that they're doing, you've got to have the capacity to oversee contractors. And I will say that Australia nicely complements technical assistance with that work. So it doesn't ignore working with the borrower and strengthening the borrower. But again, that takes time and resources. And if those resources are not there, the capacity thing is probably the first thing that will slip. The next thing will slip is the analytic work that's done. 
you know, in the end, you'll, you'll still be doing projects, but they won't be as effective. And you won't be dealing with what I think are the key issues, the underlying policy issues. So you can leave all of those to the World Bank and the ADB, but I don't think that's a good strategy. I think you have some advantages in working in the region that are important and should be explored. Now, I was tough on independence because I was caricaturing what so many people talk about. But on the, on the small eye of, you know, you want independent people, you don't want people to come in the room and feeling they have an obligation either to the bosses or to someone else. And it's, it's a tough issue. Um, I can honestly say we've never had anything edited. We've never been told we have to change anything in the analysis we've done. Um, or it's been done by OD. But you know, they are members of DFAT, and I recognize that at times it's going to make them think about some of the judgments and issues. But I think it scores, I, you know, I think OD scores pretty high on the independence front. I've seen no problem of you know, management interference or management questioning of what was done. And I think most likely that the work that emerged um, on the quality issues emerged sort of silent, you know, sort of quietly and effectively. You know, we, we were not kept out of the problem. We raised an issue, people invited us in and said, we're worried about this issue as well. Do you have any suggestions? So, you know, I feel the independence is a pretty, pretty robust factor in defect. And I always say, you know, you get so independent. I mean, there's the story of what the UK did. Actually, just as I was coming to head IEC, the UK essentially threw out the IEC model and went and, and set up a very small group of people that were part-time. They were going to oversee consultants doing work. And so I was asked uh, in, in the early discussions with, when, when it was still all said, should, you know, should we be thinking about that? And my reaction is very strong. I said, look, this is going to be a disaster. I said, what's going to happen is consultants are going to think it's their job to criticize DFID, which they'll, you know, they're good consultants in the UK, so they'll do that. DFID will then have no choice but not be constructive in response, but fight like hell to prove those observations are wrong. And that's exactly what happened. Now, interestingly, the woman who's now head of the IEG went over to that group and actually really changed the incentives and got away from the model using outside consultants, but had a model which much more, much more like what, uh, what DFAT Dif Dif is using. And so, you know, she was able to turn the program around, but it, it goes to the point that you can push independence to a point that you're dysfunctional in terms of actually working within the system. And I, as I said, I, I have no fear of that particular problem, given my experience the last seven years. So that's all. I think we will have to direct from close there. Um, I do just want to say a few quick thank yous. Um, I want to thank our colleagues at the Office of Development Effectiveness for partnering, partnering with us again on this event. Um, it's a great um, opportunity for us to, to bring you and have to um, take on Australian aid. Um, I would also just flag that we had a blog up this week by Rob Christie from ODE um, on performance culture and Australian aid. So if you haven't read that and would like a DFAT take, unfortunately we couldn't quite get today, um, do check out the blog at fairpolicy.org. And we'll definitely be hosting more events together with ODE um, once I pass the pesky caretaker period. <laughs> but most of all, I would like to thank Jim, who, um, as Stephen noted, has come to the centre many, many times over the years. I've been at the centre six years, so you probably have been coming a little bit more than than me, but um, you're definitely one of the visitors that we really look forward to welcoming on, you know, once or twice a year and seeing you and, and hearing your perspective. So please do join me in thanking Jim and wishing him the best on his <laughs>